of Father Charles E. Cudlin from Royal Oak, Michigan. Ladies and gentlemen, I bring you greetings, not only from Father Coughlin, but from all those persons and groups scattered throughout this audience. This broadcast constitutes a mass meeting, a modern mass meeting through the facilities of radio, if you please. Together we stand, together we are assembled in the cause of peace with justice for all. For the past two Sundays, your reverend spokesman has dealt with the question of the Neutrality Act in general and with the lifting of the embargo in particular. He pointed out that cash means credit. He reminded you that credit now means the same as it meant in 1916, and that means war. 22 years ago, we sent our boys abroad to help collect the debts owed us by England, France, and the Allies. They failed. They learned that making the world safe for democracy was a bait which trapped them and us in the net of depression and radicalism. Father Coughlin, amplifying the thesis that cash means credit, showed last Sunday the preparations now completed in this country to abolish democracy here, to regiment our people, to conscript our youth, and to fight the battles of the Europeans. These are not fancies, they are facts. Today you will have explained and analyzed for you the President's message to Congress. Now do not be downhearted. We can win if we work to win. We, the people, have it within our power to retain the embargo, to avoid taking the first step that leads to the last step of war. So let's be up and doing as were the Minutemen in days gone by. If we lose this congressional battle now being waged, we will lose our liberties. Remember the aftermath of the last war, depression followed by radicalism. Picture the aftermath of the next war, another depression and a worse form of radicalism. Before presenting Father Cogden, may I announce some of the meetings being held this week to support our cause. New York, Boston, Cleveland, Buffalo, Albany, Rensselaer, Hartford. In New York, Senator Patrick McCarran will speak tonight at the Manhattan Center, 8th Avenue and 34th Street. At Boston, the Mothers of New England will assemble next Sunday on Boston Common. At Cleveland, Archbishop Schrems will preside at a meeting next Thursday night at the Municipal Auditorium, and Father Coughlin will be the guest speaker. At Hartford, the Reverend Edward Lodge Curran will speak at the Bushnell Memorial Hall next Friday. At Albany, Rensselaer, Monsignor Glavin, Father Murphy, and Father Brennan ask us to announce a peace parade for today. And at the Shrine of the Little Flower, Royal Oak, there will be a period of prayer lasting nine days to which Detroiters are invited. It begins tomorrow night at 8 o'clock. And now this radio meeting is called to order. May I present your spokesman as he addresses his remarks to your congressman. Ladies and gentlemen, Father Coughlin. My friends and fellow citizens, to repeal or not to repeal the embargo on arms, munitions, and materials directly related to war, that is the question which occupies the attention of the majority of our countrymen. Still fresh in our memories is the message delivered by Mr. Roosevelt to the members of Congress convened in special session. Still re-echoing are his reassuring words, namely, the executive branch of the government did its utmost within our traditional policy of non-involvement to aid in averting the present appalling war. Having thus striven and failed, this government must lose no time or effort to keep the nation from being drawn into war. While no one either doubts the sincerity of the chief executive or opposes his laudable objective, nevertheless, there are many citizens who dispassionately disagree with his methods 
to obtain the objective of keeping this nation from being drawn into war. Our president is convinced that by repealing the embargo on arms, munitions, and materials directly related to war, and by returning to international law, this end can be best achieved. Those who disagree with him adhere to the opinion that the ends of peace are best served by retaining the embargo and by sustaining and confirming the Neutrality Act which supersedes international law. In this republic, where freedom of expression is held in such high esteem, and where every humble citizen enjoys the right of conveying his convictions to his duly elected representatives, I seek the indulgence of this audience while I submit respectively the following remarks to our congressmen, both in my own name and in the names of you, my friends. Honorable ladies and gentlemen, members of Congress, in the message which President Roosevelt addressed to you, he stated, I have at all times kept the Congress and the American people informed of events and trends in foreign affairs. Those were his words. Therefore, at the outset, we the laity in this great republic feel encouraged to express our views to you, honorable members of Congress, because we are informed through the graciousness of our president on many matters pertinent to the present question of repealing or not repealing the embargo on arms. Before venturing to discuss these matters, may I record for your consideration, honorable congressmen, certain conclusions generally accepted by the people Conclusions resulting from your official pronouncements and from your practiced foreign policy. We the people have no inclination to approve the evil doings of unjust aggressors. We have long since concluded that none of the combatants in the European war are just and non-aggressors that none of them are democracy, that none of them are motivated purely by religious and humanitarian aims, that in common they desire to retain their ill-gotten imperial gains or through force to acquire more territories at the expense of the poor bleeding populations whom they have regimented. Moreover, we people are suspicious of the policy of good neighborliness, oft repeated by you American leaders, because we have watched it develop into a policy of world policemanship. In fine, we the people feel that we are being abused through official efforts which attempt to wed our destiny to those of Europe and Asia, and particularly to those of Imperial Britain and France. Honorable Congressmen, we the people also know the story of the Peace Treaty of Versailles. We know that it constituted the most immoral aggression in all the annals of history save perhaps the conquest of India in 1757. We know that Britain and France were more responsible for its injustices than were all the other nations in the world combined. We know that your predecessors in Congress refused to accept its unjust provisions. 
we know it inflicted dire penalties upon the German people and permitted their warmongering leaders to escape. We know that its injustices gave birth to a Hitler. And we know that as long as human nature is human nature, there can be no peace without justice. With the knowledge of these things, we weigh the words which our president voiced when he said, quotations. We have learned that men, and when we deliberately try to legislate neutrality, our neutrality laws may operate unevenly and unfairly, may actually give aid to an aggressor and deny it to the victim. Thus, honorable congressmen, while we the people abominate both Hitlerism and Stalinism. We are not concerned if our neutrality act and our embargo strengthen or weaken Britain and France, strengthen or weaken Russia and Germany, even though these latter nations are classified as the aggressors. For we are American nationals. We are not the world's international policemen. Our supreme concern is our own permanent peace. Through the instrumentality of a lasting, sound, neutrality act, regardless of whom it may favor or disfavor, just as long as it definitely favors the citizens of the United States, just as long as it is based on the principles of imperishable justice. Mr. Roosevelt reminded you, honorable ladies and gentlemen, that during the War of 1812, we became involved in European wars with the result that part of the capital where you convened was destroyed by fire. He said, beginning with the foundation of our constitutional government in the year 1789, the American policy in respect to belligerent nations, with one notable exception, has been based on international law. Be it remembered, he continued, that what we call international law has had as its primary objectives the avoidance of causes of war and the prevention of the extension of war. The single exception, so says Mr. Roosevelt, was the policy adopted by this nation during the Napoleonic Wars, when, seeking to avoid involvement, we acted for some years under the so-called Embargo and Non-Intercourse Act. That policy turned out to be a disastrous failure, said he. First, because it brought our own nation close to ruin, and second, because it was the major cause of bringing us into active participation in European wars, in our own war of 1812. It is merely reciting history, concludes he for this part, to recall to you that one of the results of the policy of embargo and non-intercourse was the burning in 1814 of part of this capital in which we are assembled. Honorable Congressmen, I am not so sure how we the people 
will interpret what our chief executive said in this passage which I have read for you. If I recollect the facts of history, we became involved in the War of 1812 because Great Britain, as usual, violated international law by insisting on the fictitious right of search and seizure. Search of American ships for British deserters and their consequent seizure. And it was this same international lawbreaker that burned our capital. Moreover, from the foundation of our constitutional republicanism, our foreign policy was not entirely constructed upon the international law devised by European nations, as Mr. Roosevelt says. Rather, it was wedded to George Washington's policy of no foreign entanglement and in contradiction to Britain's interpretation or violation of international law in 1812. I believe it is important enough for me to requote what Mr. Roosevelt said about international law. These are his words. Be it remembered that what we call international law has had as its primary objectives the avoidance of causes of war and the prevention of the extension of war. Unquote. The verb has had, which Mr. Roosevelt used, honorable ladies and gentlemen, most truthfully expresses what once was and now is no more. In official testimony, the Honorable Cordell Hall intimated not once, but oftentimes, that there is no such thing as international law. Probably Mr. Hull's direct words are not of current interest to the public at large. Nevertheless, I humbly refer the ladies and gentlemen of this Congress to inspect a government document entitled Hearings Before the Foreign Relations Committee of the United States Senate, 74th Congress, Second Session, pages 17, 32, 39, 42, and 140, respectfully, to corroborate the statement I made. On all these pages, honorable ladies and gentlemen, you will read confirmatory testimony submitted by the eminent Secretary of State for the adoption and passage of the present Neutrality Act because international law had de facto ceased to exist. Your experience and the experience of millions of my fellow citizens recognize how truthfully Mr. Hull spoke. The last remnants we saw of international law were the scraps of paper consigned to oblivion when German troops ravaged Belgium in 1914, when Great Britain instituted an unconditional embargo on foodstuffs in 1960, an immorality, by the way, forbidden by every tenet of international law. And finally, the very shadow of international law disappeared only two weeks ago 
when the same Great Britain instituted a partial blockade against Germany on her North Sea shore, blockading the entrance of food for civilians, which is in direct violation of the former international law which once existed and which the informed persons of this generation recognize as having disappeared. Moreover, honorable congressmen, when international law existed, the clause respecting blockade definitely stated that no nation could institute a blockade against another nation unless it was effective. That is the word used in law. Is not the present British blockade ineffective insofar as it does not pretend to comprehend the Baltic shores of Germany? and insofar as it is a constant threat to the neutral shipping of Norway, Sweden, Belgium, and Holland, before the World Court was instituted, before Great Britain and France particularly established that instrumentality of the World Court to protect its League of Nations, there was an international law regulated more or less by the Hague in Holland. Since the invention of the World Court, international law has become British law and French law. And the voice of the Hague has been silent. In your consideration, concerning the lifting or the keeping of the embargo, honorable congressmen. We the people, your constituents, implore you to gauge correctly the inconsequential argument that is related to international law. Analyze grammatically the exact words of Mr. Roosevelt when he referred to international law. He referred to a law that has had as its primary objective the avoidance of the causes of war. Oh, he was meticulous in avoiding the use of the present tense and thus of being guilty of a misstatement had he said, international law which has as its primary objectives the avoidance of the causes of war. Therefore, in the year 1935, when you and your immediate predecessors in office felt constrained to write a neutrality act it was of urgent necessity to do so. For, in other words, you passed a neutrality bill to take the place of an international law that had died for the avoidance of war. The international law of which Mr. Roosevelt speaks and which did in the past, take into consideration the avoidance of causes of war. But the international law, which has ceased to exist. The United States of America cannot, therefore, in her grand isolation, subscribe to an international law which at this very moment all the belligerent nations in Europe have scorned and continue to scorn, thereby making a mockery of the word international. And, honorable congressman, it is impossible for us to square our foreign policies with international law because, I repeat, it does not exist.
as our eminent Secretary of State, Mr. Cordell Hull, has truthfully gone on record in stating in the book to which I referred you. Therefore, while discussing this Banquo's ghost of international law, Permit me to submit several more reflections which are pertinent to the subject. It is an important subject because the whole argument of lifting the embargo rests upon the premise of going back to an international law. International law, the ghost which Mr. Roosevelt now seeks to conjure, was largely a collection of precedents laid down by neutral and belligerent nations during a period of more than 600 years. The various Hague Conventions and the Declaration of London in 1909 were the chief attempts on the part of the nations to organize these precedents into one body of law. In the Declaration of London, to which Great Britain adhered until 1915-16, the commodity of food was recognized as conditional contraband. That is, it was liable to seizure by an enemy only if it was destined directly to the armed forces of a belligerent. However, to interfere with food shipments to the civilians of a warring nation was expressly forbidden by the London Conference in 1909. In other words, international law allowed one belligerent the right to starve another belligerent's army but did not give it the right to blockade food being transported for that belligerent's civilian population. I repeat that Great Britain herself contemned and disregarded this international law in 1916 and thereafter when she directly collaborated in starving the German civilian population. How hypocritical did Great Britain prove to be when one inspects the faithful record of history. In 1904 and 5, during the course of the Russo-Japanese War, Russia declared all food shipments to Japan as absolute contraband. Then it was Great Britain and the United States of America who immediately protested that this was a grave and serious violation of international law, thereby forcing the Tsar to withdraw his embargo. Honorable ladies and gentlemen, in 1916, and again today in 1939, where were the American protests against the British contraband of food, against the British scuttling of international law? Oh. Or are we the people constrained to listen to the sepulchral temptation of international law merely to be conjured with for some esoteric purpose which we the people do not understand? In concluding this portion of his address made last Thursday, Mr. Roosevelt said to you, honorable ladies and gentlemen, 
I now ask again that such action be taken in respect to that part of the act which is wholly inconsistent with ancient precepts of the laws of nature, the embargo provision. I ask it because they are, in my opinion, most vitally dangerous to American neutrality, American security, and American peace. So spoke the president. Well did our chief executive use the adjective ancient, for verily they are very ancient. Nevertheless, I think I share the opinion of most persons in these United States and certainly express the opinion of the friends for whom I speak. When I say that we are not prepared to live by international law when all the belligerents of Europe have spurned it, The proven attitude of Great Britain and France, of Germany and Russia towards the former laws of nations, supports the contention that we should abide by our own neutrality act until these nations learn to love justice and pursue it. Until such time, we will hold fast to our embargo on arms and instruments of war, and we will strengthen rather than weaken our neutrality act. That is a thought, honorable ladies and gentlemen, for you to entertain. as you re-listen to the words international law. Basing his contention that we should return to the sanctity and efficiency of an international law which does not exist, which thought, by the way, your most preeminent scholar in foreign affairs, Senator William Bora of Idaho, will be glad to expand upon, Mr. Roosevelt proceeded in his message to Congress to explain the nature of our present Neutrality Act and to plead for the cancellation of the embargo on arms, munitions, and materials of war. He pointed out that the present embargo provisions prevent the sale to a belligerent by an American factory of any completed implements of war. But they allow the sale of many types of uncompleted implements of war, as well as all kinds of general material and supply. They furthermore, continues Mr. Roosevelt, 
allow such products of industry and agriculture to be taken in American flagships to belligerent nations. There in itself, concludes he for this portion of his argument, there in itself, under the present law, lies definite danger to our neutrality and our peace. Honorable ladies and gentlemen, this is a very factual statement of the law as it now exists. It expresses one of the major portions of our present neutrality act. But we the people, honorable congressmen, desire that you support this part of the Neutrality Act with this modification, namely, prohibit American ships carrying anything including food to any warring nation. Immediately following this paragraph, the President made an appeal to the material cupidity of the American people in these words, said he. From a purely material point of view, what is the advantage to us in sending all manner of articles across the ocean for final processing when we could give employment to thousands by doing it here? Incidentally, continues the President, and again from the material point of view, by such employment we automatically aid our own national defense. And if abnormal profits appear in our midst, even in times of peace, as a result of this increase of industry, I feel certain that the subject will be adequately dealt with at the coming regular session of the Congress, unquote the President. Need I remind you, honorable ladies and gentlemen, not in bread alone doth man live, but in every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. It is not consonant with the high ideals of Americanism to weigh our prosperity in the scales of crass materialism. For what doth it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his soul? A purely material point of view is not the point of view accepted by the majority of Americans. It may be it may be the point of view adopted by warmongers and by a few thoughtless thousands who are prepared to sell their liberties, yea, their immortal souls, for a mess of poisoned pottage. It may be the point of view adopted by the few Iscariots Iscariots of yesterday and of today. Iscariots in politics. Iscariots in finance. Iscariots in every walk of life. Who re-echo the words of their prototype. How much will you give me? How much if I betray this man unto you? But it was not the point of view accepted by those who made America great. And it is not the point of view of those who for conscience sake shun unclean profits and hope to keep America great. And finally, members of the August Congress of the United States, our president would be the last person, seriously, 
to attempt to build the ideals and prosperity of this nation upon the grass which is today and which tomorrow is cast into the oven. The last person to appeal to the spiritual-minded American public from a purely material point of view. For he has spoken oftentimes of God and concluded his address to you last Thursday with these words. May you by your deeds show the world that we of the United States are one people of one mind, one spirit, one clear resolution walking before God in the light of the living. In this day of crisis, I, too, would make these words my words. Therefore, in your momentous consideration, we, the people of the United States, impose our confidence in you to the end that your decisions will not be arrived at from a material point of view. Pursuing his methods to Congress, Mr. Roosevelt, referring to the so-called Neutrality Act of 1935, said, if a war in Europe had broken out prior to 1935, there would have been no difference, for example, between our exports of sheets of aluminum and airplane wings. Today, there is an artificial, legal difference. Let us be factual and recognize that a belligerent nation, continues he, often needs wheat and lard and cotton for the survival of its population, just as much as it needs anti-aircraft guns and anti-submarine depth charges. Let those who seek to retain the present embargo position be wholly consistent and seek new legislation to cut off cloth and copper and meat and wheat and a thousand other articles from all of the nations at war, concludes Mr. Roseman. It is needless for me to re-emphasize to such an intelligent body of ladies and gentlemen who oppose this Congress that following 1918 down to the years 1935, there was no international law Britain and France and Germany and Russia had dissolved its fundamental substance. The voice of the Hague, I repeat, was silenced. The voice of the world court was but a borrowed echo of the unjust peace treaty of Versailles. And the voice of truth and of justice amongst nations had been lost in the mad melee of radicalism and greed. Since 1935, we Americans, thanks be to God, have had a neutrality act. And we have been able to peer through the crimson mist of our past experiences and walk thence into the clear shining of sanity and spiritual awakening with a policy of no blood business. Ladies and gentlemen, we have had enough of the blood business. We have learned that there is no prosperity in machine gunning our brothers in Christ. Oh, we are those who are consistent. We who seek to retain the present embargo position are consistent in our belief that they who use the sword shall perish by it. And moreover, we are reasonable. Let the belligerents of Europe come. Let them pay honest value for cloth and copper and meat and wheat, for commodities which are not blood business commodities. And let them carry these away to their homelands in their own ships for tax. Gladly 
We will consent to that. But in the name of the Prince of Peace, ask us not to participate even indirectly in a war where all the belligerents are steeped in injustice by selling munitions of war. Oh, do not, honorable congressman, ask us to participate in it even indirectly, lest when you and we come before the throne of God, we will be held accountable as cooperators in crime and servants of mammon. Most Americans recognize that there are two points of view to this question. Mr. Roosevelt and those who support his views establish one point of view, we the other. That Mr. Roosevelt is sincere in his expressions, there are few who will doubt. Nevertheless, if you recollect, he said, I give to you my deep and unalterable conviction based on years of experience as a worker in the field of international peace, that by the repeal of the embargo, the United States will more probably remain at peace than if the law remains as it stands today. Honorable Congressman, a predecessor in the presidential office, the late Woodrow Wilson, made a similar statement relative to keeping us out of war. He too was sincere. Oh, but the experience of facts is more valuable for our guidance than is the sincerity of promises. Thus let this be clear as expressing the point of view of those opposed to the president. Keep American citizens from war zones. Keep American ships from sailing in war waters. Keep America out of the blood business. But keep sane. And sell foodstuffs and non-war materials to any belligerent nation, provided that belligerent nation pays honest cash on the barrelhead and carries its own cargo in its own ships. Honorable ladies and gentlemen, may I read for you portions of one of the most famous addresses ever enunciated in this fair land of ours. The brilliant orator who spoke the following words shared with me his opposition to blood profits and I gladly share with him my views relative to the emptiness of international law. Mr. Roosevelt, by the way, based his appeal for the lifting of the embargo on international law. Lest you forget, these are his words. I seek a greater consistency through the repeal of the embargo provisions and a return to international law. Now with these words in mind, honorable congressmen, I beg you to attend to the peerless words of a peerless orator whose preeminent position certainly should have weight in fashioning your judgment during this perilous period. He said, quotation, Permanent friendships between nations as between men can be sustained only by scrupulous respect for the pledge to word. In spite of all this, we have sought steadfastly to assist international movements to prevent war. We cooperated to the bitter end, and it was a bitter end, in the work of the General Disarmament Conference. When it failed, we sought a separate treaty to deal with the manufacture of arms and the international traffic in arms. We participated again to the bitter end in a conference to continue naval limitations. And when it became evident that no general treaty could be signed, 
because of the objections of other nations, we concluded with Great Britain and France a conditional treaty of qualitative limitations, which, much to my regret, already shows signs of ineffectiveness. So spoke a great heart, which understood the vanity of international law. Again, he said, it is clear that our present policy and the measures passed by the Congress would, in the event of war on some other continent, reduce war profits which would otherwise accrue to American citizens. Industrial and agricultural production for a war market may give immense fortunes to a few men. For the nation, as a whole, it produces disaster. It was the prospective war profits that made our farmers in the West plow up prairie land that should never have been plowed. Today, we are reaping the harvest of those war profits in the dust storms which have devastated those war plowed areas. It was the prospects of war profits that caused the extension of monopoly and unjustified expansion of industry at a price level so high that the normal relationship between debtor and creditor was destroyed. If we face the choice of profits or peace, the nation will answer, we choose peace. And if war should break out again in another continent, let us not blink the fact that we would find in this country thousands of Americans who, seeking our immediate riches, fool's gold, would attempt to break down or evade our neutrality. Honorable congressmen, so sounded in Ciceronian sentences a magic voice correctly appraising international law as it really is something ineffective. A magic voice correctly appraising the profits gained from war as they really are. Fool's gold. A magic voice correctly appraising our choice between profits and peace. We choose peace. And, honorable ladies and gentlemen, yes, who spoke this masterful philosophy, so contrary to the philosophy of Tash and Tari and profits through blood? Where were these words of wisdom enunciated? And when? Here is the answer. These words were spoken by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt himself on the day of August 14, 1936, at Chautauqua, New York. Need we further analyze President Roosevelt's message to Congress? Need we further inspect our esteemed president's message to you, ladies and gentlemen, delivered last Thursday in the glass of his statements delivered more than three years ago when times comparatively were calm and men's minds more serene. Ladies and gentlemen, in humility, I address these words to you in my own behalf and in behalf of the many friends who indirectly at least have asked me to speak them. I bid you adieu. May God the Father bless you. May God the Holy Ghost enlighten your mind. And may God the Son fill your hearts and souls with a love for your fellow men and a love for that justice which we Americans must first seek. Justice with peace and peace with justice before we can avail ourselves of prosperity. And now, my friends of the radio audience, 
I thank you for having borne with me as I express my views on the question of lifting or of retaining the embargo in arms to all congressmen. As I pointed out last week and the week previous, our engaging in the merchandising of murder is the first step which leads inevitably to the last step, war. Now that you have organized resolutely to sustain this point of view, I congratulate you on the splendid petitioning which you've done this past week in writing millions of individual letters to your congressmen. To you belongs the victory. Ten million more letters, however, from you this week and next week will ensure that victory. Therefore, carry on for prosperity according to the pattern of peace. Carry on, for God wills it. At this juncture, there is no need for you to waste your time or energy in marching on Washington. Remain at your posts. Marshal your fellow citizens in your neighborhood, club, office, and church. Instruct your honorable congressman to hold fast to the neutrality law as it existed since 1935, making only those amendments which will strengthen it. Let no embargo on arms be lifted. Let America adhere even more strictly than ever to the policy that made us great amongst the nations. The policy of George Washington. The policy of no foreign entanglement. The policy of our president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, down until the Chautauqua speech, 1946. This is your day, my friends, your victory, and possibly the salvation of our civilization. Oh, the beacon lamp which you will light in Washington this week through ten million more letters will soon shine round the world. Shine in all its brilliancy, even though today it is only a light that shineth in darkness. Ten more million letters. That is your quarter this week. Ten million hearts beating at harmony. Ten million messages advising your congressman not to take the first step that leads to the last step of war. Ten million barricades against lifting the embargo. Ten million indications that we are busied with God's business of peace for our homeland, not with Satan's business with the blood of slaughter for foreign lands. You will win if you do not lose heart. God bless you. Ladies and gentlemen, be sure to write to Father Coughlin this week for a copy of today's address. Above all, organize your groups, your churches, your clubs, your offices to institute a campaign of letter writing. Social Justice Magazine will amplify the remarks of this afternoon and will announce other meetings. Beginning two weeks ago, Father Coughlin entertained little or no hope for stemming the tide of the embargo lifters. Then there were few congressmen willing to support the views of those opposed to lifting the embargo. Then there was every likelihood that the closure rule would be imposed upon the Senate, thus limiting debate on the entire neutrality question. But times have changed rapidly, and so have the opinions and views of our congressmen. There are now more than 39 senators who share our views under the leadership of the great William Borah, the man who defeated the hopes of the League of Nations advocates, the World Court advocates, and other internationalists. Definitely, we are gaining strength. Definitely, however, we must gain more strength. Therefore, let every club, every church, every school, every college, every neighborhood organize to voice their determinations that we will not enter the blood business that we will not invite disaster by accepting fool's gold. If you write enough letters, your congressman cannot afford to vote contrary to your wishes. He would be your misrepresentative 
instead of your representative. Bear in mind that petitions are not worth the paper they are written on. Individual letters, special delivery letters, registered letters with return receipt requested, and telegrams by those who can afford to send them. These are your weapons to ensure American peace. These are your barricades against which the propaganda of the internationalists cannot succeed. Dozens of school principals have advised us that they have had their pupils organized to write letters to hold fast to the embargo. Hundreds of clergymen are pleading with their congregations to exert themselves for the salvation of America. Keep America out of war. Keep her out of the blood business. And stand by Mr. Roosevelt of 1936, who called war profits fool's gold, who called international law to all intents and purposes ineffective. The Mr. Roosevelt of 1939 surely will not go back on the Mr. Roosevelt of 1936, nor will any of us go back on George Washington's no foreign entanglement. None of us will go back on the soldiers who proved their death or by their death that they died in vain. None of us will go back on the laborers and farmers who suffered most from the depression that followed the last war when the munitions plants closed down and poverty stalked the nation that played with fool's gold. None of us will go back on America. America first, last and always, independent of what Europe or Britain wants us to do. Father Coughlin's address is yours for the asking. Write to him this week and encourage him to keep up the fight for God and country and for the little children for whom we want to leave this land of ours a safe land of prosperity. This is your announcer, Franklin Mitchell, inviting you to join us next Sunday once again. Ladies and gentlemen... We presented the regular Sunday afternoon address of Father Charles E. Coughlin from Royal Oak, Michigan. Statements made and views expressed on this program are made on the sole responsibility of the sponsor and do not reflect the views of this station, its management, or personnel. Father Coughlin's address has been a presentation on your dial at 1,250 kilocycles. WHBI, Hoyt Brothers Incorporated, Newark, New Jersey.